Fancy Coats Between the World and Me is a an epistolary memoir. It is a memoir that uh, Coates addresses to his son, Samari. So given that form, Coates allows himself, the eye of the book, to be very intimate. He's speaking to one person. And, and again, that allows him uh, not only a, an, an intimacy of language, uh, but also it, it allows him a vulnerability. Um, it allows him a, a an invitation to candor that may not be there if he had imagined himself writing for a, a, a large audience, a general audience. So I think that's where I want to start with thinking about this this beautiful book is what positions the the I occupies based on this choice to make it a memoir addressed to one particular person addressed to his son. So let's think about the adjectives that would describe this voice, this I. Um, clearly he's comes from a place of love and affection. He's writing out of a place of love and affection. He's writing the letter, the memoir letter to his son in hopes of educating his son about the horrific difficulties of being a black body in a racist society. There's also um, in this I that Coates creates in this epistolary memoir um, a, a rather blunt honesty. He's very clear that he's not here to give his son any illusions. He's very clear that he is not trying to convince his son that things are better um, than they really are. He is very honest and ultimately says that what we can most do now as black people in a racist society is struggle intellectually. And of course he models this in his own intellectual um, endeavors um, through his father, uh, First and foremost, his father provided him with a very lengthy and varied reading lists uh, so he could educate himself about the, the race issues in America. And then he goes to Howard, of course, Coates does. And, and there he's opened up not only to more books, but also to professors and also to um, black people from all over the world, a diaspora, he, he calls it. So, so this modeling of, of, of intellectual struggle and raising of consciousness is very much a part of Coates's message to his son. But of course, the book's published. So even though it is written to his son and it has that that personal personal per, sorry, personal intimate, emotional, um, sincere feel to it, because Coates publishes the book, it is also addressed to a general audience. So it's just interesting to think about how the book has a kind of double vision. It has its eye very much on the sun, but also has its eye very much on a, a wide readership. And this wide readership, well, um, clearly um, at, at certain points Coates is addressing a black audience, um, making a black audience aware of the racism of, of, of so-called white America. But also there's a sense, too, I believe, that he's addressing so-called white people as, as well um, to alert them to how their so-called good intentions might actually or are actually part of, it, of systemic racism. So what are some um, techniques of expression that um, Coates uses? Well, first of all, irony. Irony runs throughout the book. Uh, we could call it situational irony. In, in every case where he mentions the American dream, which for centuries uh, people who believe themselves to be white um, have seen as this image of America as a place where you can come and you're free and you can succeed and you can ultimately live out, if you're willing to work hard enough, uh, your dreams. But in Coates's world, the dream is actually a synonym for systemic racism, the, the systemic oppression of black bodies um, in hopes of financial and, and other kinds of gains. So 
that's only one of many ironies that run throughout the book. Um, a word that traditionally means one thing, hope, American dream, here means the opposite, uh, cruelty, injustice, oppression. Uh, Coates also uses counterpoint, um, contrast. So opposed to the American dream, which is this abstract notion of whiteness that tries to justify its racism by saying it's part of this great American dream where all people are free, as opposed to the dream is a place like Howard, which is not generalized at all. Coates is very careful to be extremely particular about the different kinds of black people that exist in the Howard Yard. He's not simply saying, oh, these are black people, but these are black people from all over the world, um, very different kinds. So he's pushing against homogenization there, um, but also he's countering the, the variety and, and the vigor and the exuberance of Howard, which he calls Mecca, to the dream. That's, that's one of um, several counterpoints. So we have irony, um, counterpoint. Um, I think that also, what else did I did I mark here? Um, yes, uh, Coates will frequently write about scenes with with extreme specificity. The book is largely about the dangers of abstract thinking, generalization, homogenization. Uh, that's how racism can occur when you lump groups of people un, under the concept of a color. These are white people. These are black people. Um, when, of course, people are, are, are varied and, and complicated and never fit neatly into um, a, a clear category. So it's interesting to note times when Coates will describe a scene in, in intricate lyrical detail um, as a way of modeling a certain way of perceiving the world, a particularizing way of seeing the world as opposed to the generalizations that he's pushing against. Um, also, Coates uses repetition a good bit um, within paragraphs. Uh, you, you'll see him use the same, the similar sentence structure throughout an entire paragraph more, more than once. Th this is a, a kind of rhetorical heightening. Uh, we see this a good bit in someone James, like James Baldwin, um, who's The Fire Next Time is a model for this book. The Fire Next Time is a, a book James Baldwin wrote about racism. He addressed it to his nephew um, back in the 60s. Uh, Richard Wright is also someone who's very much behind this book. He has a poem called Between the World and Me. But it's interesting to note the, those, those paragraphs where Coates is, is really emphasizing a point to his son, and he will use r repetition throughout the sentence for a kind of rhetorical heightening. So I would say his, there's a kind of lyricism of his particular gaze, which gives moments of rhetorical intensity to the book. But also there is this, this repetition he uses, which also gives the book a kind of lyrical intensity. So to, to go back to the irony, it's interesting that you know, this book uses irony so freely and so effectively, but also it uses the lack of irony, this, this kind of presence, this, this very, very intense attention to bodies, to physicality um, is also prevalent in the book. And that's just another counterpoint. And I would say, so I've talked about irony, counterpoint, I've talked about um, particular, highly particular descriptions, I've talked about repetition within paragraphs. Uh, but ultimately we can say that, that, that the book is what it's about. It's about largely the value of intellectual struggle. Uh, as a black body, um, Coates and his son, Coates believes, should, should read and think and, and not be duped by the generalizations of the American dream. And the book actually embodies that by Coates's persona is constantly questioning, qu constantly qualifying, uh, constantly talking about his own intellectual struggles, talking about his vulnerabilities. So it's a dramatization of the kind of thinking that ultimately it recommends. And if there is any kind of um, hope in this book, and it's not traditional hope, as in if we do X, the world will get better. It's more a sense of, as he says to his son, keep thinking, keep thinking, be realistic, 
don't try to convince yourself that the world's okay. Don't try to don't take the the the, the myth of the dream seriously. Think about yourself as a black body. Think about physical limitations placed on you in the society. Start there. And if there is such a thing as hope that will emerge, it will grow from this rigorous attention to physical circumstances. So these are, I think, some of the the primary craft choices that, that Coates is making in this in, incredible book that is you know, it's published in 2015, but now it's it's more pertinent than even then, given given all all, all the all the horrible violence on black bodies that we've seen in the in the past year in America.